If there's one thing the indie community excels at, it's nostalgia. There was a period in the 2010s when every second Kickstarter or indie darling was a 2D pixel art game based on classic SNES titles. I'm talking Shovel Knight, Undertale, the myriad Metroidvania games. It was a collective agreement that we as a community wanted more of this style of game. While I adore these games, there was one era that I feel was unfairly shafted in the nostalgia department. I was born just a little too late for the SNES, and my heart resides in the PS1. I love the jagged textures, the stilted voice acting, the tank controls, everything that comes with the era. I've made my love for PS1 horror games quite apparent, and while beautiful pixel art has had its time to shine, I think it's only fair that our jaggies get their own love. Enter the genre of low poly horror. I like this name better than PSX horror, because not every low poly game is attempting to be a PS1 game but they do all share some common features. They're a little rough around the edges, but I feel that only enhances the horror. Today, we'll be looking at a few low-poly horror games that I stumbled across on my recent Itch.io deep dive. Night shifts are creepy. There's a reason it's quite a common trope in horror, and Security Booth is all about just that. You play as a security guard who is tasked with letting people into a facility. However, you have strict instructions to only let authorized workers in. Think of it as a highly simplified version of Papers, Please. A car drives up to a gate, you check their license plate and cross-reference it with the list of employees, and then either let them in or turn them away. The concept is simple enough, but it manages to convey a sense of dread as you progress through the game's short runtime. Each time a car arrives at your post, you have to take those few seconds to open up your book and start analyzing names. Every time you do, the world continues to move around you. Every time I opened that book, I felt like this would be the time there'd be something waiting for me once I exited the black screen. Add on top of this, the notes that keep appearing around you, along with strange noises and bangs, and you've got a game that manages to frighten you with very little effort. Also, if your game includes a figure standing in the distance with no way to interact with it, I'll always give you points. With only about 20 minutes runtime to get both endings, I won't talk much more about the story or the scares, at risk of spoiling anything. Security Booth is a short and sweet horror game that shows sometimes all you need is a small location and good sound design to create a frightening experience. While low poly horror has been around for a while, there's one very specific genre that I've never really found a game to scratch the itch that it left. PSX Survival Horror. I've talked at length about my love for classic Silent Hill and Resident Evil, and while I think people know they're very popular games, not many people really get the genre and understand how to do it justice. Enter Casper Cross and Alyssa the Awakening. In this game, you play as a girl named Alyssa, who wakes up in a giant mansion wearing what appears to be a doll's dress. With no clue about how she got there, you begin exploring the house, only to find creepy mechanical creatures roaming the halls. The house itself obviously takes inspiration from the classic Spencer Mansion, but it's a lot less claustrophobic. Alyssa controls and moves just like a classic survival horror game tank controls and all. Everything from the fixed camera angles, the enemy designs, the item placement, the puzzles, everything screams early survival horror. There's only a demo out right now as the game got delayed by an extra month, but by the time this video comes out it should be either out or just coming out. The best way for me to sell it to you is that it's like if Rule of Rose was a PSX game. The creature design and the shopkeeper feel straight out of Rule of Rose, while the gameplay leans way into Resident Evil. The game also has some amazing music and sound design, and the voice acting sounds straight out of a kitschy 90s dub. Enemies drop cogs that you can exchange in the shop for more weapons, ammo, and costumes. Although I'm sure they'll be harder to obtain in the full game, the demo gives you more than enough ammo and enemies to unlock a few weapons. The demo itself is only about 20 minutes long, but it gives you a big enough area that you can ignore the puzzle to trigger the end of the demo, and just mess around with it, learn how the game works, and unlock some cool stuff. Even if the game is out now, I highly recommend checking out the demo at the very least. It's an extremely faithful recreation of one of my favorite genres, and it deserves your attention. Also, it has built-in controller support. I cannot stress how amazing that is. Another short game jam game, Ghost Study is all about low frequency sound and its relation to the paranormal. If you aren't aware, Infrasound refers to sounds of below 20 hertz that our ears are unable to detect, and there have been conversations about whether these kind of sounds could cause hallucinations, including ghost sightings. There's a much more academic conversation to be had about Infrasound, but I'm just some guy reviewing itch games, 
So basically, that's all you need to know. The game is very short. You basically walk around your room while these sounds play from a speaker, and according to the itch page, the game actually includes real low frequency sounds. Being honest, the game is a cool idea, but the gameplay isn't why I'm talking about it here. It's only about 10 minutes, and the jump scares are very aggressive, which makes it kind of obnoxious to play. However, throughout the game you can collect these optional notes, and not in a slender way. The notes actually have codes and links on them. Each link brings you to different studies on infrasound, academic papers, news articles, videos, and eventually a Google form that asks you about your experience. I'm an absolute sucker for things like this. I think it's a cool way of adding some depth to your game and giving the player a reason to actually seek out your collectibles. So. While it may not be the best game on this list, nor do I think the game is anything particularly special, I applaud the developer for making something a little more interactive, and for that, I think Warkus deserves a shout-out, and I'll definitely be looking at some of their other stuff in the future. Every now and then, you play a game that completely baffles and confuses you, to the point where you can't stop thinking about it, and Paratopic is one of those games. From the minds of Arbitrary Metric, Paratopic is a game about a few things. It's about smuggling tapes and having conversations with garage workers. It's also about wandering through desolate woods and photographing birds. Or maybe it's about an assassination attempt. <laughs> Paratopic is about all of these things, and it conveys each of these stories in a unique manner. While its story is complex and definitely deeper than I'm able to convey in a few short minutes, its gameplay is remarkably simple, even boring at times. Most of the game is spent driving down old empty roads, watching the scenery go by and listening to the garbled noises from the radio, or just quietly strolling through the woods following colourful birds. Calling it a horror game isn't entirely correct, however, the game is clearly very creepy. The bleak atmosphere is only enhanced by the incredibly eerie soundtrack and low-poly environments. Arguably the creepiest parts are the conversations. The game has a sort of simlish language, where you can make out some of the words being said. It's almost like you're hearing people speak a language that's similar to English, but just not quite the same, and their melting faces and jittery movement doesn't help this uncanny feeling. The game walks this tightrope between creepy and peaceful. For every minute you spend wandering the woods and examining the sunset, there's another minute driving down a long dark road, watching decaying pieces of industry appearing over the horizon, at first seeming more like giant creatures rather than just piles of steel. The woods section is arguably my favourite part of the game. The best way I can describe it is that it feels like stumbling across an SCP facility long after it's been abandoned, and maybe discovering it's not as abandoned as it seems. Paratopic is only about 50 minutes long, but it's well worth the 6 euro asking price. It may not be the most outright scary, and it may be messy and confusing to follow at times, but if you can let yourself loose in this world, I promise it'll engulf you with a sense of uncanny dread. Sometimes all a short game needs is a great concept to carry it, and VHS has an excellent gimmick. Another game jam game, this one doesn't have a story to follow or any real text at all. It's pure gameplay. The idea is that you have a camera with two frequencies. One allows you to see the shape of the environment, and the other lets you see the monsters stalking the halls. A very simple premise, but the kind that I could easily see expanded into a much longer game. Similar to what I said about Security Booth earlier, in horror games, the last thing you want is for your vision to be obscured for any given time, and every time you switch views in VHS, there's a brief moment where you can't see anything, so you better hope the monsters aren't right in front of you when your visibility eventually returns. The general aesthetic of the game is pretty nice, although I would like a bit more variety if it was a little bit longer. I also like the monster design a lot, even if it could feel a little goofy and exaggerated if you removed it from the context of the game. All in all, it's a neat little idea that I'd love to see expanded on. Desolate hallways, empty woods, 
NPCs cycling the same old dialogue, droning ambient sound effects. There's something so fascinating to me about abandoned digital space. If you've ever visited an old forum in recent years and perused the long abandoned posts with the current site viewers count stuck at one, you'll understand this feeling. Pagan Autogeny is, quote, an experimental first-person open-world role-playing game set in the digital ruins of a largely abandoned MMORPG. The world is as vast as it is empty, and exploring the digital ruins feels wrong, like you're trespassing on a private server, and any moment someone could appear just past the fog. Much like some of my other favourite exploration games, there isn't an obvious goal at first. You have a stat sheet that increases by picking up arbitrary items that infinitely respawn, you can find and equip weapons to fight enemies, there are repeatable boss fights that require specific armour and strategies to kill, but saying that this is the point of the game is misleading. The game is specifically built with the ethos of player-hostile design in mind. Basically, it's meant to frustrate you. There are no in-game item descriptions for anything. Most of the game time is spent finding bizarre objects and trying to find a use for them. The few NPCs that do exist speak in riddles, and offering hints that seem obtuse at best. I played this game for a few hours, and I only feel like I've scratched the surface of what could be hidden beneath. This is probably a good time to mention that this is actually the third game in a series of games titled Pagan, a series which I will be taking a further look at later. I'm not going to say much more, because this is the kind of game that I think you'll already have decided if it's for you or not based on the description alone, but I haven't stopped thinking about it since I first touched it. The only advice I will give you is that you should pick up every item you stumble across, and specifically try to find the body parts. That should be enough to get you started on the game's mystery. For the vast majority of your time with it, Autogeny fills you with a creeping dread that doesn't quite go away, but it also has its moments of true horror. It's the kind of game you're better off experiencing for yourself, and one that I know I'm not quite finished with just yet. So good luck, Wayfarer, and Godspeed.